Hello, I'm Russell Westacott from LGBTQI Plus Health Australia. My pronouns are he, him. Um, and I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the Gadigal people, the lands which um, we meet here in Sydney, and also acknowledge that some of our speakers on the webinar today are on different lands around the country. Um, today's webinar, we will be exploring and examining the implication of the findings from the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety in regards to diversity and inclusion in aged care, and in particular, the potential impacts of LGBTIQ plus care recipients um, moving forward. Um, the Royal Commission is probably the single most uh, biggest piece of reform for the aged care sector. That will happen in a generation. And of course, our community wants to know what impacts it will have for them. So we have a good lineup of speakers um, from different areas across the sector today. Um, and I will go around in a moment and um, introduce all those people. And they will give some background about who they are and their affiliations. But we have Samantha Edmonds, Pat Sparrow, Kathy Mansfield, Craig Gear, Corey Earlham, and we'll be doing a cross to Robert Day. And Robert is the Assistant Secretary of the Dementia and Supported Aging Branch at Commonwealth Department of Health. Um, for technical reasons, he can't join us today, but I did put a question to him last night, um, and that question was recorded, and we're going to play that today. So again, welcome to this webinar. Um, there'll be an opportunity for uh, viewers to ask questions. And I believe on the YouTube uh, 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 link that you'll be uh, viewing, there'll be an opportunity to post questions below the video. And some of those questions will make it here to uh, me to be able to ask some of the um, panelists. Um, their thoughts, but um, I also want to make the point that um, LHA, um, uh, LGBTIQ plus Health Australia, um, is having a conference starting uh, April 16, um, and that conference on its first day of April 16 will have another um, session on the Royal Commission, and some of the people who are at today's session will be at that particular session. And we invite you to ask questions either throughout today's um, webinar or in the days after. That website will be alive and active. And we'll try and fine tune the panel for the April 16 event. So I'm going to go around um, first of all and let everybody introduce themselves. And then I'm going to ask a series of questions. So, Samantha Edmonds. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm sitting today, which are the Darug and Gundungara peoples in the Blue Mountains, um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging from these communities, and also to acknowledge any Aboriginal people who've joined us here today. Um, my name is Sam Edmonds. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the chair of the aged care sector uh, committee diversity subgroup. And I also have a couple of other hats. I'm the uh, manager of policy and systemic advocacy at the Older Persons Advocacy Network. And I also run my own consultancy that works with aged care providers to make them inclusive of LGBTI older people. Okay, thanks, Sam. And Pat Sparrow. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm coming to you from today, which are the Bunyurong Boon Warung and the Wurundjeri Woi Warung of the Eastern Kulin Nation. Um, as you can see, I'm Trish Sparrow. I'm a she, her. I am a, um, the CEO of Asian Community Services Australia. We represent not-for-profit aged care providers who deliver residential care, home care, and independent living options. And I've been in and around the aged care sector in a variety of different roles, including working uh, as a consumer representative at various points in time and uh, getting aged care right for all older people is my absolute passion. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Kathy, Kathy Mansfield. Good afternoon, all. 
Um, I'd firstly like to acknowledge uh, the lands I come from and, and the uh, traditional owners, the Gunai Kurnai people of Gippsland. So, and moving forward, I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge the, the work that um, uh, LGBTIQ Australia uh, has uh, shared with me and allowed me to grow through. I've been part of the Royal Commission Advisory Group uh, that uh, was uh, involved up there in Sydney uh, along the pathway uh, to today. Thank you. Um, next, we have Craig Gear. Hi, I'm Craig Gear. I'm the CEO of the Older Persons Advocacy Network. I'm here today with Russell on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, um, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, Older Persons Advocacy Network is a member organisation of nine organisations delivering aged care advocacy, and we'll talk a bit more about that today with Russell. Great, thanks Craig. And Corey Olam. Hi, I'm on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. My uh, pronouns are he, him, and I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of Council on the Ageing Australia. Before here, I worked at Acon Health and I was the ageing aged care convener for the National LGBTI Health Alliance, as it was known then, working on the world first Australian government's inaugural uh, ageing and aged care strategy. So really happy to be back in this space talking to you all today. Great, thanks, Corey. And as I mentioned, um, Robert Day will be splicing him in a bit later on with some of the questions. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to go around and ask the panel um, th their individual thoughts regarding the Royal Commission findings, particularly in relation to diversity and specifically um, their, their potential impact for LGBTIQ plus communities around Australia. So if I could just go around in order again. So Samantha Edmonds, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, great. Thanks, Russell. Um, look, I think the commission report is a really good start. There's definitely some things we can work with in there. Um, it is disappointing that LGBTQI plus people weren't mentioned um, very much and there weren't the specific recommendations around that considering the amount of uh, representation and the hearings that uh, we attend well, when I worked at the LGBTI Health Alliance we attended um, but there's certainly work in there that we can build on and utilize and I think certainly we can use that to then expand into uh, greater inclusivity across all the diversity groups I, um, I was really pleased to see reference to the action plans um, that there was a diversity um, standard but I'll go into that a little bit later Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, Pat, would you like to give your little um, synopsis? Sure. And uh, look, it's a really it's a really important report, but I think that there are a number of areas where it perhaps hasn't gone as deep as we'd all like to see it. So I think it does um, some really good groundwork, but I think it is um, disappointing that there weren't specific recommendations across the diversity groups and obviously um, for the LGBTIQ community. I do think that recommendation 30 does actually give us a better basis to operate on than what we have now. It's probably the one that I think, while there are references through the report, it's probably the one that's the most specific. Um, and I think it will give us a better basis to work from than what we have currently. Um, and I can see they're bringing it up on the screen for you now, which is just about making sure that there is uh, proper uh, training, cultural safety and trauma informed training and service delivery and also that providers are held accountable that if they do say they can deliver uh, great quality care for a particular group that it actually um, holds them to that and I think that's important and that's why I think that's a better basis than what we have currently. Although I'd note that um, 2024 um, which some of this recommendation relates to 2024 is a, a fair way off for people so I think that's something we need to be looking at. And we might zone in on recommendation 30 if we've got some time, and certainly we can take that to the conference on April 16. Um, so uh, thanks, Pat. Um, Kathy, um, for you, uh, what were the, um, uh, the, the particular things that in relation to diversity and the LGBTI communities that stood out for you or didn't stand out, perhaps? Well, um, I must point out 
that I haven't read the full eight volumes or whatever it is, the uh, the huge thing. I've read the executive summary, and I was disappointed, very disappointed, um, that there was very little reference in that executive summary. Uh, the, I think there was three or four sentences uh, mixed in with some uh, discussion about uh, diversity in general, and also uh, there was... Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, appropriately, uh, a much more discussion perhaps for our First Nations people. Either way, uh, I recognise that uh, based on the 2016 census, uh, the Commonwealth thinks there are only um, about 3.3% of, of uh, us uh, community people in the rainbow community or the LGBTIQ plus community. And that indeed is um, a basis for uh, some concern, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Cathy. Um, and Craig, what were your initial thoughts? Yeah, so um, like the recommendation one, so a new Age Care Act and two and three will come to a little bit more um, in a second. Uh, there was a th there was good recommendations around the need to have some tailored supports for uh, for older people um, and an expanded visitor scheme, which I can touch on a bit later. I was a bit disappointed as well that the, the, it sort of had, there's a, a tip of the hat to cultural safety. Um, if we can make that a broadness around cultural safety for all all mm. uh, diversity mm. groups, then I think we can get there. But a um, little bit more on that would have been nice. Sure. Okay, thanks, Craig. Um, and Corey, um, for you, your initial thoughts? Look, I think we need to recognise the Royal Commission wrote 2,828 pages. It made 148 recommendations and it did it during COVID. Um, so the Royal Commission report as a whole for across the board for older people, I think is a great step forward. But one of the areas that absolutely didn't get time to revisit after their first uh, query is diversity. So there's really only direct recommendations uh, in two, number 30 and number 21D, which I think we're going to pull up now. So 21D talks about the fact uh, that the aged care quality standards should be updated to reflect the diversity uh, frameworks and the underlying action plans, so they're considered to make it mandatory. So this is the LGBTI uh, action plan for aged care. So there's a bit of a challenge that always comes up when these things come on uh, around how big and how many things providers who are underfunded, overworked, understaffed um, are able to do. So one of the challenges for government around how to implement this will be about making it tangible and practical. And I think Sam probably will talk about some of the great work that the diversity subgroups doing to try and uh, do that. So we need to be bold in what we ask for, but it has to be practical in what it's implemented. So I'm looking forward to a discussion about how we might be able to get all aged care providers to say what they're doing for diversity, not just listen to the few things the Royal Commission said, uh, and that they'd be required to annually publish that. So I'm, I'm excited by the opportunity and the platform that we get by this, um, but recognise that you know, COVID uh, resources and things like that have caused Royal Commission to come out pretty light on in its recommendations. But that's only the beginning of the journey for me, not the end. Yep. Okay, um, half glass full, Corey. That's um, good to hear. Um, and a good segue into my very first question that goes to Sam Edmonds. So Sam, as chair of the diversity subgroup, your committee has been working with key stakeholders since 2017 to break down barriers within aged care that negatively impact LGBTIQ plus um, people and other, others from other diverse groups. What opportunities do these findings from this Royal Commission give you and your committee to pursue diversity and inclusion issues within aged care? Great, thanks, Russell. Um, look, as I mentioned briefly before, we think it's a really good starting point and it's certainly something that the subgroup can work with. 
Uh, we felt the Royal Commission was really well intentioned, but that it only understood diversity at the levels of principles, not the actual practical experiences and challenges for people with diverse characteristics and life experiences. Um, and we know this is often the case when people aren't from or don't work uh, closely with diverse and vulnerable groups and can only really have that understanding from a distance. So we're hoping the government and groups like the diversity subgroup and other peak bodies can look at that and, and consumers, older people themselves, can look at how do we practically implement those principles that are within the Royal Commission report. We're really pleased around the language about person-centred care, but um, we need to be careful because it can be quite sort of become more theoretical. Uh, we need to be really aware of the practical impacts of disadvantage or life history on people and that impacts on their ability to, and their confidence in exercising choice and control over their lives. So um, the subgroup's really interested around um, how we ensure that there's those principles of equity applying when within that concept of person-centred care. Um, we really love to see that there's strong regulation and oversight um, needed to, in, to enforce that culturally safe care and it was really good to see that focus within the report and again that's something we can look at a little bit further. Um, in terms of recommendation 30, it was a little disappointing that it only focused on training and specialisations rather than embedding diversity into core business. Um, not that either of those are not really, really important and we do need to verify that services um, are specialised and there's some work going on at, that, at the moment in that area in terms of my aged care. Um, and training and cultural safety in the broader sense of cultural safety is absolutely important um, across all diversity groups. Um, we also really welcome the uh, recommendation, so the second part of the recommendation in recommendation 30 on the data and the collection of data. At the moment, uh, there's very limited data collected around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and culturally and linguistically diverse people, but certainly no data collected on LGBTQI plus people or other diversity groups. And we're not going to know if change is happening. We're not going to know if people are accessing aged care. We're not going to know if, if they're having the same outcomes if we don't actually start collecting that data and have it publicly reported um, and available. Yeah. We also think it's really important that diverse and vulnerable groups are properly engaged in consultations and co-design. Um, so certainly that Council of Elders that Commissioner Briggs mentions, um, we'd like to ensure that it's not just the elite, that there are the voices of vulnerable groups there because they're the people that actually need to be heard and listened to. Um, and they're the ones that need to participate in these things. Um, in terms of the Rights-Based Aged Care Act, again, a fantastic starting point. We hope that um, to see some of the principles that they highlighted in the uh, report actually become rights rather than remaining as principles. But we also think it's really important that there's specific mention of diverse and vulnerable groups in the Act and that's something we will be working towards. Uh, though we also agree with Commissioner Briggs' recommendation around the special needs terminology in the current Act um, and that that shouldn't change into the new Act. We need to look at different language to um, cover diversity groups and vulnerable people. So I guess for the subgroup, it's great to see diversity mentioned. We've got plenty to work with and I did go into each of the recommendations a little more fully, but um, I won't do that now and if we, you know, if we have an opportunity to come back to that because there's lots of different recommendations um, like the star star ratings, the quality mm. indicators, um, the one that Corey touched on around the diversity framework and action plans that I'd you know, like to sort of provide a bit more detail on. But um, as I said, we are disappointed that the recommendations aren't as strong as we'd like them to be. Uh, we know diversity groups make up over 50% of those accessing aged care, so they really do need to be core business rather than a continual um, add-on. And also, but, you know, we would like to acknowledge and applaud the focus on Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the report and also some of the specific recommendations around rural, remote and um, mm. dementia. Um, just briefly going back to the standards, um, would like to see the standards reviewed, certainly would like to see the action plans and diversity framework reflected in those. And the subgroup has always well, about to start looking at how can we uh, make the action plans a little more practical and how we can practically implement them through that. Um, and we've also started having some discussions around is there a need for a diversity standard and what would that look like and what would that mean? So 
it started us on some really good thinking. It's pushing us along on some of the work that we were starting to do anyway. Um, and um, we're sort of, you know, as others have said, this is a really great opportunity for reform and we're hoping to be there to ensure mm. that diversity, um, all the diversity groups, um, including LGBTQI plus people, uh, do become core business for aged care. And as I said, if we have a bit of time later, later, we'd certainly like to look at some of those other recommendations a bit more closely. Thanks, yeah. Russell. And of course, the challenge is, um, you know, almost 3,000 aged care facilities around Australia. Um, we can probably identify um, a handful of facilities in inner Sydney, in a Melbourne and inner parts of other uh, cities that are doing a good job around LGBTIQ plus um, uh, aged care service delivery. Um, but there's uh, thousands of other facilities that um, aren't in those catchment areas. Okay, I'm going to take the next question to Pat Sparrow from AXA. Um, Pat, um, AXA has a broad membership base of providers, and you might want to remind us exactly uh, how many that is. How do you think these recommendations, if fully implemented, will create better diversity and inclusion um, policy and practice amongst aged age care providers across the country? Thanks, Russell. It's a really good question. So just to sort of uh, give a bit of that, we have over 500 organisational members and they run multiple facilities in that sort of 3,000 um, group. And we think we represent roughly around 60 to 60% 60 of those providers. Mm -hmm. um, we're not for profit, so across residential home care and um, independent living. And obviously, and I actually remember one of the first things I, I came to in my job uh, at Council of the Aging as a consumer representative was a, a really fantastic LGBTIQ event um, and listened to older people who'd had experiences and I'd come from service provider land and I came and I sat and I listened and I learned so much about the experiences that people had had with providers who I'd been working with and who I now represent again. So I, um, I completely understand so many of our members are faith-based um, and I heard some things that day that, um, that were really quite distressing and they stayed with me ever since. So there is a huge job for us to do and, and taking your point, Russell, and I think we have to talk about what full implementation means. And I think we've seen this in the past sometimes where, um, you know, full implementation is seen as people saying that they're going to provide a service or being able to tick a box that they do X, Y, Z. So for me, full implementation is actually now about unpacking what it really means. And Sam touched on it in her presentation and we started to grapple as, uh, as an organisation, as extra about how we are going to support our members across a number of things they need to represent. And we need to unpack what is actually meant by human rights. And then within that, what's actually meant on a day-to-day -day basis, not on the principle level, because I think on a principle level, people will be able to say, yes, we agree with that principle and they'll tick the box. So the work that we have to do with our members is what does it mean on a day-to-day -day basis to actually provide services on a human rights basis? What does it mean on a day-to-day -day basis for you as the care worker, you as the board, you as the CEO to actually get it right for um, LGBTI groups and other diverse groups? I liked the pathways that were in, in there being talked about for um, uh, First Nations people and for people with dementia and wonder whether there's some piece of work that we need to do as providers with organisations like your own about, can we actually break it down and talk about what does it mean on a day-to-day -day basis for a care worker, for a nurse, for all of those people to deliver the kinds of care that you actually deserve to, to get and that we should expect um, as providers and as a community that should be delivered? So I think, you know, the best we can say at the moment is there are some things to work off, but we're going to have to work together and really unpack it to make sure that we can fully implement it. And then if we fully implement it and we get that real understanding, that's when we'll start to see the shift in my view. Mm. And I think that's a really good point, um, Pat. Uh, from my read, uh, for some of these things to be implemented successfully, um, it will take collaborations and partnerships and um, uh, different sectors coming together so that things can be achieved. I don't think um, any one organisation or, or group can, can achieve that. Um, and I'm Russell, going to... could I... Could yes. I 
Russell, could I just could I just say that I also want to make it clear that that's I, I don't want people to think that we're saying we have to do it in collaboration and that providers aren't responsible. Providers are responsible, and we yep. have to make sure that we do better. But yes, that collaboration is going to be important. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, and sorry, I didn't mean to sound that way if that came across like that. Um, so a question to Kathy. Um, Kathy, you were part of the LGBTIQ plus Health Australia's Royal Commission Advisory Panel um, when, when it was known as the Alliance. And you have been um, part of the discussions that have been where there's been concerns uh, about the lack of mention of LGBTIQ plus people since the findings have come out. What are your views on this? Given that you were a member um, of the, um, what was the Alliance Royal Commission Advisory Panel, the, uh, there were things that you would have been pushing for. Um, the findings are now out. You're hearing from colleagues within the sector that there's not enough mention of LGBTQI. What are your views? What are your thoughts? Thanks. Um, I'm not at all surprised that we only got three or four um, sentences in the executive summary. Uh, I'm saddened. I'm saddened and I'm for our, for our whole LGBTIQ plus community because um, we are still in many, many cases invisible. And I, I think uh, we have to recognise the Royal Commission report uh, uh, was so big and so complex uh, that uh, we couldn't expect to uh, focus in uh, all areas. However, however, the, 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 the real problem is, I think, that we are still invisible. The only way we're going to get through this is through personal stories to let people see that we are human too. And um, we, we need to recognise that there are special uh, extra pressures on uh, the LGBTI community uh, in aged care uh, with isolation. However, we are also part of a whole group of other diversity subgroups that have um, highly difficult um, integration issues in aged care as well. So it's it's complex. Yep. Okay. Um, thanks, Cathy. Um, uh, and very sage ad advice and sage words. Um, Craig, I'm going to cross to you. Um, I've been in some meetings that you've been in um, with since the findings have been handed down. Um, and you commented, um, uh, I've heard you comment that uh, the uh, findings have not been delivered in a human rights framework. What do you mean by that, given that the findings do talk about a rights-based mm. approach, um, but you're, you, you seem to have a, uh, a slightly different point of view that it's not quite a human rights framework. I wanna just explore that a little bit. What do you mean by that? And how should the findings have been presented or angled in, sure. in your view? Um, so I'd hope I haven't misspoke in some of those, uh, those meetings. But um, the reason, I suppose, is that by framing it in, rather than just a rights, but rather a human rights framework, then you start to keep the human at the centre of it um, rather than it being just about... Um, I suppose your consumer rights where you can make a complaint against something that sort of thing um, looking I've got the recommendations here so I mean some good things about the new act saying that, and that, that being a foundation of what has to happen so that's good that the, it, it should push for self-determination I think that's really important um, equal access um, and then in the section where it does talk about rights it says the right to fair equitable and non-discriminatory treatment in receiving care for me though, I suppose if I was myself going into an aged care facility, I want it to not be just non-discriminatory, I want it to be celebratory. So if you framed it under human rights and in a more positive, a positive rights basis, you might be able to actually say, um, I have the right to, like if we go back to the Charter of Aged Care Rights that's here, here at the moment, 
talks about um, I have the right to have my dignity, my identity, culture, and diversity valued and supported. So I find that that's a much stronger framing of mm. it, and mm. so I'd like to see a little bit more of that in there. Now, as Pat was saying, it's sort of there's they're great words on a piece of paper, but what's it going to mean in reality? How are we actually going to mean that the practice of every aged care worker is understood under a human rights? We had a symposium recently, with, um, and Daniela Greenwood said, um, person-centred care is well and good, but it just means sometimes it be, um, you can be bo bossed around a bit more in a more in individualised way. So how are we going to do that switch, and how are we going to do that for uh, LGBTI um, elders? And that, that's, the, I suppose, yep. the framing. If, if you embed that in, but then it's the getting the human rights into practice as sure. well. And do happen. you think it's the job of these peak agencies, all of our peak agencies, to be pushing that and nudging that a little bit further so that the rights-based piece that the Royal Commission findings are describing, that we get it over the line to more of a human rights? Yes, yeah. yes. And I think without the absence of an international convention, I think that can be a challenge in doing that. Um, so it's it's... It's close, and how much we can we can actually get there? How much we can do that in implementation phase yeah. uh, would be really interesting. But um, rewriting the act is is a key yeah. to it. And I'm, living it on the ground is going to be different. I'm glad you brought up the point about an international yeah. convention because that's something that we're going to be addressing at the conference that we're having, um, and that's on the uh, human rights uh, session on day one of the conference, April 16. And we will be looking at the role of um, having an international convention and how it hel helps us to lobbying in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that. Okay. So the next question is the tricky bit, and I'm glad I've got some tech people in the room to help me. Um, this is to Robert from the um, Commonwealth Department of Health, who I mentioned before. And this is the question that um, we put to him. Um, the question dovetails on what I asked Samantha Edmonds a little earlier. Do the findings provide scope to the department to support diversity and inclusion initiatives such as the diversity subgroup? And what might that landscape look like from a departmental perspective? And now we're going to slice it over to Robert, who did this answer for us last night. Um, so thanks, Russell. And look, I'm really sorry that I can't be there to be, participate live in the panel. Um, although we couldn't get the technical stuff to work out, my team and I will be listening to the conversation and taking notes. And I really look forward to being a, a more active participant at the conference on 16 April um, when that opportunity comes around. In response to your question, um, I think, yes, the Royal Commission's report does give us a mandate to do more work in the area of diversity and inclusion. Um, diversity is one of four areas that the Royal Commission has said needs to be core business uh, for the aged care sector going forward. Um, and I think that gives us quite a strong mandate to go forward. It was also interesting for me that the Prime Minister, uh, when he was releasing the Royal Commission report and was asked by journalists what was most important to him, he talked in a lot of detail about uh, an aged care system that puts the person needing care at the centre, um, and not in a generic way, but actually being the centre of every decision that's made from both government and from uh, local aged care management. So I think that's in itself um, a powerful mandate around diversity as well. Um, I think one of the challenges about the, the goal of making diversity core business is um, translating that intent and that principle into the gritty reality and the specific reality of individuals needing aged care and the specific reality of their their lives. Um, we know from some of the work the Silver Rainbow has done previously that there are risks around the cycle of invisibility and people assuming that there's not um, people from diverse characteristics or life experiences in their service that they don't take action and so then newcomers to the service don't identify because they don't have the confidence through that and that becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. Um, so I think what we've got to do to try and break that is have transparency and accountability at a whole of system government level um, and at the level of individual aged care providers 
so that we're aware of the full range of diversity of people trying to access aged care and we've got some capability for how well we're, we're catering for those people. Um, we also then need to get all the main policy levers to work together in the right way. So funding arrangements, legislation, data, governance, we've got to get all of those things tracking and providing accountability and transparency over diversity. Um, one of the things the government's already indicated it will do is the review of quality standards recommended by the, the Royal Commission and diversity, the Royal Commission has said, needs to be a key focus of that. Um, and in terms, Russell, of your specific question around the, the diversity subgroup, look, I think absolutely there's a, a role for, for the diversity subgroup in guiding us as we um, work to make all those level levers work in the new aged care system for diversity. Um, I do think we also then need to think about how diversity is reflected at the main table, as it were, for the, the various advisory forums that are set up for government in the new aged care system. Um, but the diversity subgroup absolutely has a role going forward as well. Okay, so thank you, Robert. And I know Robert and his team are at the Department of Health in Canberra are watching the webinar live. Um, so thank you for that contribution and we look forward to having you at the conference on April 16. Um, Pat, I'm going to cross back to you with another question. I'm slightly jumping out of order here. And I'm doing that because um, there's a question I was going to put to you and some people have actually asked a very similar question um, uh, online. So this is a question in real time. Um, so the question I was going to put to you is uh, extension to my earlier question. Do you think the findings have enough teeth to ensure that all faith-based providers are responsive to LGBTQI needs when in aged care. And I'm just going to add to that because the question that has actually come in online um, talks about the same thing, but also in relation to sister girls and brother boys and um, people from those uh, communities. So um, just wanted to sort of get you to uh, narrow down and focus in on those faith-based providers that are part of your uh, network or, or coalition? Sure. Um, so I, I think the conversation's kind of shown that the, the recommendations have talked about um, uh, some changes to the standards, et cetera, that would enable that to, to maybe have more teeth, although that depends then on how good um, the, uh, the agency is. And I think we should the commission, sorry, I always call them the agency, but it's the Quality and Safety Commission. Um, and there is a recommendation around how they also need, we need to do a, a, a capability of, about them uh, to make sure that they can and do have the skills to monitor what providers are doing and appropriately pick up and, and guide providers on that. Um, so I think it's, it's hard to talk about whether they have enough teeth because at the moment I feel sure that what people would say to me from uh, from the community is that, that they don't currently. And so until there's an adoption and a change in the way that providers are asked to, uh, are asked to do that, then they probably don't. Um, the recommendation looks at what needs to change in the standards and we've talked about the diversity framework. And I do have to agree with Corey, I think we have to find a key way of holding providers accountable and, and providers you know, do wanna be transparent and accountable. Um, and while I know you're asking the question about faith-based, I think the important thing to look at is that whatever we land with the standards and across the system will hold all accountable uh, providers accountable, including faith-based. And I understand yeah. there are some additional challenges um, around faith-based. But what we have to do is make sure that the system holds all providers accountable. So yeah. I think on the diversity framework conversation and, and 21D, we do have to find um, something that's in the standards or in the guidance material or however it's done that is very clear uh, about what holding ca account providers accountable. So uh, whether that's that we do say that providers have to demonstrate what they're doing and how they're doing to be inclusive and um, honour diversity um, and it might be at that level and providers might have different ways of doing it and that's where it becomes important about how the Quality and Safety Commission then reviews that and it determines whether it's appropriate or not. And I think the other really important thing and I think the, there are recommendations around this, 
the making sure that we're getting the voices of the people who are getting the services to um, to triangulate that and to make sure that it's true and making sure that when the commission does that, it's picking up um, diverse groups that are within it. So mm-hmm. there's probably, you know, I, I think looking at it from your perspective, we would say there's not enough teeth. We have to, as providers, also look at that we don't get so tied up in regulation that we can't do anything well. Um, but between those two levels, there is a way, I think, of making sure that there is more meaningful and, and perhaps a little bit more teeth to making sure that providers, whether they're faith-based or not, are actually accountable and held accountable. Sure. Okay, thanks, Pat. And I, I suppose the question uh, also um, went to the heart of intersectionality. Um, and I know that with SAM's um, diversity subgroup, that intersectionality has been a huge part of its work since 2017. And indeed, the, um, the diversity action plans, the diversity framework, um, all of those documents looked at intersectionality. Um, and Sam touched on those before and how, how they um, could be implemented or further implemented, I should say, um, under this new um, set of findings. Um, so, Cathy, I'm going to go back to you. I'm going back into order now, and I'm, I'm sorry that I skipped you. I just wanted to uh, ask Pat that question because the question was coming in live. Um, so, Cathy, is there two or three key issues that you think LGBTIQ plus Health Australia should continue to lobby for due to the findings overlooking or perhaps glossing over some of the issues? Um, and, and what do you think those two or three things, and I'm asking you again as somebody who was on the um, advisory group uh, for LGBTIQ plus Health Australia, um, are there two or three things that you think that this organisation should be pursuing or prioritising, I should say. Thanks, uh, and, and, and yes, I do. Um, the uh, fact that um, minorities aren't seen as special, uh, um, and uh, a front of mind, of course, is uh, my, my peers in the uh, LGBTIQ plus uh, community. However, um, we must also recognise there are other minorities and I think that potentially uh, there could be uh, broader discussions across a range of minority groups, whether that be uh, a- across different uh, uh, national heritages or uh, whether it be disabilities. I, I think uh, we have to try to make visible the issues created by the Uh, pressure of isolation on uh, many subgroups, many uh, minority groups. Uh, Now, the way we can do it is through personal stories and uh, working further out into the general public because they still don't understand either gender or sexuality uh, in in the way to have a comfortable conversation. I think um, while we, we, we really need to recognise that the Royal Commission work uh, has provided a whole group of aspirational targets and those aspirational targets are fantastic. We have yet to get uh, any sort of uh, uh, funding uh, likelihood from government. Indeed, we have to wait till 2024 uh, if the government chooses to even implement a new uh, aged care system. Um, and so the reality is uh, we have to do more work. We have to work together more in, the, uh, in my community. And uh, it's just a matter of uh, reaching out to the public and uh, making uh, them aware that uh, we need to uh, be very serious about potentially a doubling of the 1.3% uh, that the aged care budget, uh, 1.3% of GDP that the aged care budget in Australia will fund. And um, the uh, fact is, in OECD countries, uh, it's normally uh, about in the top countries between 2.5% and 4% of GDP. So it's critical that we uh, make this 
uh, an important issue for government into the future. And thank you. Great. Um, and they're excellent points, Cathy. Thank you so much for raising them. Um, Corey, I'm going to cross to you now. Um, most stakeholders and commentators say that the findings mostly deliver on the key issues that they lobbied for from the outset. Um, we've heard some pretty good um, positive stories come from various stakeholders. Coda Australia is the chair of the, the Peak Consumer Group, which is the um, part of the National Aged Care Alliance. And the Nash it's probably fair to say the National Aged Care Alliance is probably one of the most influential bodies in aged care that bring together a range of peak organisations um, uh, to try and influence um, aged care policy. Um, what do you think the two or three key questions are that the wider sector of diverse communities should continue to lobby for? So in essence, that's a bit of an extension of what I've just asked Cathy um, and her focus on uh, our organisation, LGBTQI plus Health Australia, but what do you think us as uh, part of um, peak consumer groups, diverse consumer groups as a whole, what should we be continuing to lobby for and working together on? Yeah, so it's a really good question, Russell. I think um, there are a number of things that, let's say, are applicable to the generic. So having more home care packages will help people in diverse populations because home care packages are owned by um, uh, the person and they choose who gives their service to them. So having um, ownership over your funds and how they're spent, having um, indicators of whether somebody really is a specialist on LGBTI health uh, in aged care uh, means that you can take your money and spend it with somebody who's going to give you the most appropriate care. So I think there are things in the generic um, I think Cathy just was talking about isolation there and there's some really great stuff around the aged care vol volunteers um, program and also a new uh, category of support around social support so that you can get that regardless of whether you've got a home care package or you're getting a bit of CHSP or even that you live in residential care. Um, but then um, I think some people have alluded to this, there's, there's signals in the report um, that for some uh, diverse groups, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, that we need to have a culturally safe and appropriate access pathway. So what does that mean? It means how do we wrap around that person with people they trust, with people who are going to be able to speak their language, understand their culture, understand their lived experiences and support them right the way through from starting with my aged care, going through an assessment and finding and starting with the right service provider for them. So I think those um, proposals are about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and people with dementia. And I think that gives the department and the sector a platform to say, actually, we think that's applicable to a whole range of people, potentially even including LGBTI. Mm. Um, the other one there uh, is about how do you, in the interim, navigate it. So if that's not going to happen till 23, 24, um, then uh, the Commissioner of Briggs recommends a care finder support, somebody to walk alongside you through that uh, to get started in the system. Um, LGBTIQ Health Australia is a partner of CODA's, uh, along with many people around the table, um, on delivering what's called aged care navigation as part of a trial. Um, and we're thinking that that sort of uh, sector, community uh, controlled and owned uh, approach uh, needs to still occur because some people simply will not walk through a government front door without somebody walking alongside them, unless there's somebody there that will trust them. So we need to make sure that diverse populations, including LGBTI uh, collectively, as well as LGBTI specifically, have the best supports that they can do. Yep. Okay, thanks, Corey. We're actually running a little short of time, um, and I do want to promote the fact that um, people can continue to ask questions post this webinar, um, and we will try and endeavour to get those questions answered on the um, April 16 session that we have at our conference that's coming up. Uh, we encourage you to register for the conference. 
Um, add, add some questions. We'll try and get uh, the right panelists to be answering those questions. That will probably be some of these people who were on today. There might be some others that join them. Um, and uh, I just want to spend the last couple of minutes, because we are a little bit over time, just by going back to the panel and does anybody have anything pressing that they want to um, convey or get across that they didn't in, um, in the go, go around that we did a minute ago and Craig's signaling mm. here that yeah, he's so, got something. So, so Craig. Might, I mean, Russell, you and I have had discussions before. It's kind of a bit what Corey was talking about is some of these systems that will need to be um, with um, some expertise in that specific uh, diversity um, group. And I think with my own organisations um, of our nine members, they do diversity really well. But is there other room for looking at what some of the Alliance work did before around mental health that looked at uh, some specialist type stuff as well as generalist services being all really, really well trained and competent in delivering to the specific mm. diversity population. So LGBTI advocacy, aged care advocacy will be something I think we should have a look at as well. Yeah, and, um, and that's a great point. And that was something I meant to ask you. So thanks, yeah. thanks for raising it because um, the, um, the current uh, membership of OPAN are service delivery organisations in each state and territory. Um, but what um, expertise and skills can um, peak consumer organisations like LGBTIQ plus add to that dimension. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and did any other panellists have questions before we close off? Um, oh, everyone does. Everyone. Um, Kathy, I'm going to go to you first. You look the most eager. I am eager. <laughs> I, I think the discussion uh, is very, very um, important that we consider the hearts and minds of the general public. We have to reach them so that the government can see it's a political imperative to fund properly aged care. I mean, that's the three theme right throughout the report. However, it's aspirational and we need to um, get that government support somehow. The only way is to reach out to the public. So. We've got to reach out and share our life stories to uh, so people can see that it, it, we are human too. It's important. Yep. Thank Great you. Great point. Um, Sam, you, you had your hand up. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Russell. Look, just to reiterate what um, many of us have already spoken about, and that is how important it's going to be for all of us to work together, government, providers, older people, uh, peak organisations, um, networks, whatever whatever the representative or, or the people are, I think it's going to be really important that we do walk this path together and um, push for change and reform. And I also think it's really important that in all of this we don't lose the voice of the older person and we continue to listen to them and what they want, um, particularly from diversity groups. And as Cathy said, hear their stories, hear their experiences, because that's what's going to help drive the change as well. Sure, absolutely. Um, and did I see Pat with her hand up? I didn't, but I want to put my hand up now, which is actually oh, okay. just, which is just to support everything that everyone's been saying. And and you know, I know that talking about the accountability and and whether faith based that's it, whether faith based groups are going to be held accountable. I totally understand why that's a concern, and to say that we do want to work with you, and we want to work with you on making sure that it's real about human rights, that it's that it's actually real and that it's real for people from different backgrounds, obviously the LBGTQI plus group. Um, but we also have to work together on the accountability and transparency and find the way that makes people feel more confident and is real, but also make sure that as providers, the expectations on us are realistic. Yep, okay. Yeah. And Corey, did you have your I hand up? I just want to say it's six weeks until the budget. And many times people go to me, what is it that I can do to make a difference? I feel a bit powerless out of all of this. Let me tell you, it matters what you do about it. Pick up the phone, call your local MP and just say a simple thing. I want you to fund aged care in this budget and I want you to tell me what you're going to do about it once you've done it. It's a really simple message. It's something that you can do. Um, if you're not comfortable talking on the phone, write a handwritten letter. It doesn't matter how bad your handwriting is. 
MPs respond to handwritten letters. Don't send an email because they get lots of them, they just file them away and they never see them. But around an office, they see a, a handwritten letter and it gets passed around or send a postcard. Just make sure that, as Cathy was saying, the public wants to know, but also your local official uh, that's representing you there in Parliament making these decisions know as well. Sure. So that's an excellent call to action to end on. Um, thank you, Corey. Thanks to all the panellists. And again, I just encourage people uh, to register for the LHA conference, the Health Indifference Conference and the Ageing Conference coming up uh, April 16, 23rd and 30th. It's an online event, so it's across three different Fridays um, and we'd love to have you involved. And there will be an extension of this conversation in the ageing component of that conference. Um, so please join us. All the best. Thanks so much.